Perfect. Well, um, thank you, Vignesh. Um, I have to say that this is a wonderful um, idea to have a workshop on supernumerary robotics. I think this is long overdue as a community because uh, there are so many interesting things that we, uh, we can solve with uh, supernumerary robotics and enhancements. And I look forward to work with uh, a lot of you in um, trying to solve some of the challenges. So my talk here, as Vignesh was saying, uh, relates to some of the work that in my lab we have started uh, for about 15 years ago in concept at least. Uh, and that is the, the idea of trying to have general handheld robots. Um, and uh, as part of this effort, uh, I have to uh, recognize my uh, PhD student collaborators, Yanis Stosenwald, uh, who actually will be presenting later in one of the lighting talks, uh, some of his uh, latest work. And then Austin Greg Smith, who is a former student and who uh, started this, this line um, of, of, of work in, in the lab. Um, so let's just take one step uh, back and uh, recognize that the handheld tools um, have been with hominids for about two million years uh, uh, with us. So two million years ago, we can find some of the earliest evidence of us trying to uh, use technology, which was not part of us, an extension of us, in order for us to be able to do more. So this is quite amazing. It is quite amazing that, uh, that we have found ways in which we can enhance ourselves by having these additional items. And specifically handheld tools because of our anatomy um, and perhaps the way our brains work are actually very um, convenient for us to enhance. However, at the other side, uh, we also should uh, highlight that handheld tools have really not changed, at least from the point of view of intelligence um, and understanding of our intentions, these things have not changed. So they remain extremely blunt uh, from the point of view of uh, making mistakes and allowing us to do things that uh, that we really didn't want it to do or they, they were not proper about the task. So handheld tools um, have been with us but, uh, for, for quite, a, quite a long time, but have not changed uh, that much. Can I ask if the level of, uh, of the quality of the, of the screens is coming through well and the audio? Yes, yes, we can see and hear you pretty well. So um, why handheld robots? Well, perhaps after this uh, uh, call out, uh, you will understand why, uh, why a handheld robot makes sense. But if we also look at how um, person-oriented robots are at the moment, we, we see two extremes. On one side, we see external robots that, uh, let's say, human robots or vacuum cleaner robots, they are potentially extremely useful collaborators. Um, some of them uh, may not even interact with people in the case of, let's say, a vacuum cleaner that you set up um, to work when you are not at home. Um, but they are meant to be working fully independently or at most fully independent, as, as independent as possible from, from a human. On the other side, we have uh, devices that are very uh, tightly designed to work with us, like wearable exoskeletons, which of course allow us to have these uh, mechanical superpowers. Handheld robots, we see them as a bridge between these two extrema. Um, and uh, tapping into this, uh, uh, this uh, long history of humans being able to use handheld tools. So handheld robot is, some, is, is, is a robot that is meant to operate in close proximity to a human. Actually, it requires a human to do several of the tactical functions and some of the physical uh, effort, but it also uh, has the benefit of uh, having actuation um, and sensing. And one extra thing that we're very interested in 
uh, including into this line of research is task knowledge. So, so the robot does not only actuate and sense the environment, um, it also has task knowledge. So it knows what the task uh, is. So it can actually tell when, when the user may be less skilled. So um, one of the things that we argue are very important in handheld robotics is the intuitive nature. So if you see a handheld tool, there is this inherent intuitive way in which you can grab it and for what you can use it. So we want to tap into this very, very ancient history about uh, handhelds and handheld tools and enhance them with, with this robotic uh, actuation sensing and task knowledge. So a handheld uh, robot also extends our capabilities, um, uh, but it has this uh, extra addition that is that the, the user feels in control. And this can actually be very important for uh, human robot collaboration. The, the human understands, we hope that the human understands better how to uh, work with that, uh, with that tool by the fact that it has a handheld um, shape, uh, but it also, the, the, the user feels that there is some uh, good level of control that she or he has uh, on that tool. And um, by that, we also hope that the, the human, and this is some of the lines of, of, of work that we're interested in exploring, the human also feels that whatever happens with that tool, they are, um, they are participating into that. So it's not like in a, in a full autonomous robot that is doing everything on its own and you essentially just press go. So this involvement of, of the person being part of the activity, being part of the result, and feeling that they own and, and they contribute to that result, I think it's actually a very interesting thing that handhelds uh, can bring. Uh, the fact that the robot is handheld does not mean that there is some tight integration with our body and our actuation. So actually there has been some interesting work uh, by uh, uh, researchers, and I'm just highlighting one example here, where they have demonstrated by, that by the fact that people is using a, a handheld tool, an extension of their body, their actual uh, notion of how long their limbs are actually changes just after brief uses of this tool. So this, this, this fact that you have this extra tool allows you to feel not just act as if you have extra powers, but allows you to feel and carries with you that you feel that you have these extensions to your body. So there's also this interesting connection that these tools can indeed um, help us to, to, to modify how we think about ourselves. And uh, at the end of the day, um, we are approaching into a Moravic, uh, Moravic paradox, where um, we want humans to do things that are very good at, and that can, it can uh, and that humans can do effortlessly, effortlessly, like navigating and negotiating obstacles uh, in a in a complex space. And we want the robot to take over some of the other tasks, like perhaps the precision or the strength that the human will not be able to uh, to achieve. So, how can we integrate these these two uh, strengths? Uh, is what we are very interested in, in this line of work. And this is not to say that handheld robots have not existed uh, before. So specifically in the field of medicine, there have been several works over the years that augment uh, the skills of surgeons. So on, on this side, uh, we are illustrating this work on the micron handheld um, uh, manipulator where, where that essentially allows uh, you to um, you to complete a pattern in far more accurate uh, patterns than if you didn't had an actuated tip that allows you to to perform in this case it's uh, is uh, trying to do some laser uh, surgery on the on the cornea and and then the same uh, for other devices that uh, aim to 
to help the surgeon to, to, to drill into the right places and, and up to, to, to the right degrees. So in medicine, there has been quite a lot of work in handheld robots. But um, uh, in my lab, we are actually interested in, in taking this notion into a general um, space. So general handheld robots. And we see applications pretty much everywhere that we are using handheld tools. Uh, and that can be for maintenance, for agriculture. It can be um, when your mobility may be restricted in one way or another, or essentially just to enhance your, your handheld skills so that you can do uh, more precise or more accurate uh, actions uh, with, with guidance from the robots. So general handheld robots is a space that is still not very well exploited, uh, not very well researched, and, and this is the space that we are very interested in. So our very first uh, work, this is um, ACRAD 2015, um, combines most of the elements that I have described. So we have a handheld robot that has, uh, that has actuation that is held by a person. The person is providing, in this case, some tactical motion, so where to go, um, and uh, the robot also has task knowledge. So in this case, which is a place in tiles task, the robot knows where the tiles should go and it's helping the person to, to, uh, to position the tiles in the, right, in the right spots. And I will uh, switch to optimize the video because I will play uh, this uh, video. Uh, it has no, no audio in this case, but is the video coming through reasonably okay? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a tile positioning task. So the robot is helping the user to pick the tile and then position that carefully. Um, you can see in this video, hopefully you can see, if not, let me just explain that the robot is positioned by a motion capture system. So we are interested in understanding these aspects of the interaction between the human and the robot. And, um, and that's why we are uh, helping ourselves by using this positioning system. So we know where the tiles are, we know where um, the board is, we know where the robot is, and, and we simplify in that way. Now, this moment, let me, let me highlight this moment. In this moment, the operator is trying to pick another black tile, which is here on the bottom. But the robot knows that no more black tiles are required. So the robot is actually refusing to pick that tile and points, just by gesturing, just points towards the red tile. Um, and then by that very basic intuition, uh, the, uh, uh, the robot is able to help the person to complete that task. Now let me switch again to normal mode. So in handheld uh, robotics, we have um, <clears throat> some of the basic levels of autonomy, but it's worth highlighting that uh, they behave in slightly different ways because of specific uh, space uh, that we're operating in. So we have the manual mode of autonomy. Uh, so there is no autonomy and the robot essentially follows everything uh, according to how the, the human wants things to happen. Uh, in the semi-autonomous mode, the robot may have some uh, responsibility. So it has the task knowledge and it, for example, could position a drill, but does not activate the drill. So the, 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 the task is shared and, and the robot is helping with some of, of that, but is not doing everything that needs to happen. But in the fully autonomous mode, the robot has the task knowledge and, and does all the actions uh, that it can do. It, it cannot do all the motions and all the negotiation of obstacles. So for that, it has a human. But in this case of, of, the, of the driller, the robot can position the drill, um, the drill bit, and then act and stop and start as, as necessary. So the human is, is, is helping in some more, more basic way. Uh, and we have explored all these levels uh, of autonomy as part of our uh, research. Uh, but um, we also designed uh, a new um, handheld robot uh, system, which is cable driven. So it has six degrees of freedom. Uh, it's cable driven. We have used um, as uh, space carving 
the SANA approach so that uh, the robot can uh, maximize its range of motion and also fold as compactly as possible. Um, we're not overly interested in, in ergonomics at this stage. Uh, we're more interested in understanding the, the interaction aspects, uh, but we have done um, uh, this, this design that tries to maximize the, the range of motions. And also we have developed a graceful degradation for reverse kinematics of, of, these, of these robots. Uh, so it, it starts reducing the enormous of degrees of freedom depending on, on, on the, on the uh, planning that it has to happen. And um, uh, the robot is, is also open source. So if you go to handheldrobotics.org, you can download the, the full uh, list of components and design for, for this robot. And, and we also have a paper in ECRA 2016 about this. And let me just, just play this, this video because the robot is also, uh, let me, let me stop this, let me go to optimize here. Um, I don't know how um, it's coming through, uh, but the robot is quite agile. Um, is perhaps one of the fastest uh, cable driven robots of this type that, uh, that we have come across. Um, and if the video is not coming through well, uh, you can go to handheldrobotics.org and, and, see, and see these videos. Okay, let me switch off. And okay, so now we have this video. Uh, we have, we, now we have this robot, which has many degrees of freedom. And um, we have also uh, started to explore how best a robot like this can communicate to the user what uh, help that robot needs in order to achieve the task. So um, I believe this is an important aspect in supernumerary robotics in general. How can the robot tell the user what is, what is happening, what the robot needs, or uh, the other way around, how can the user tell the robot what, it wants, what the person wants to do? And so we have started uh, this research by um, looking at different ways in which the robot can communicate things uh, to the human. So we have evaluated multiple ways in which the robot can indicate. In this case, we're using a virtual reality system that knows where everything is because we have the motion tracking system. And the task here is the, the robot needs to play in a very specific um, uh, orientation um, in three degrees of, in six degrees of freedom, um, five degrees of freedom, sorry, because we're not carrying our rotation, uh, the, the, the tip of the robot. So it's like an inspection or imagine that the robot needs to go and drill into a specific spot. Um, how can that robot communicate where the human needs to take it? So we're using, in this case, a virtual reality system. So you have a um, an arrow in, in, in 5D that is being visualized, and the robot needs to reach, um, the human and the robot needs to reach that point. We also compare, in, in case you didn't have a robot and you only had like a handheld tool that has no operation, we compare how fast and how accurately you could do this. So we have compared virtual reality, we have compared uh, a 2D display, so in this case, information is being displayed into, into this 2D screen that you can see here on the left. And, and that is guiding the, the person. Uh, and, and we have done the same as uh, if this was a handheld uh, tool with no operation. Um, then we have tried augmented reality. Um, where we have an augmented reality display, so you see through and you can see exactly where this tip is uh, and, and where the, the target should be. Um, and, uh, and we compare all these three different ways to, uh, to deliver the information. Now, the other thing that we have done is, what if there was no screen to communicate uh, with the robot? And in this case, we only use the gesturing of the robot. So the robot essentially just points to where you have to go and, and tries to guide you just by pointing. So there is no screen whatsoever. Okay. And, and then we evaluate the same. So there is no screen. The, the operator um, 
has to has to do this with um, with just the gesturing of the robot, and what are the results? So we compared virtual reality, augmented reality, to the screens and gesture. Any guesses? Uh, I know that this is not interactive, but uh, just an open question. Any guess which one of these ways to deliver information is better? It turns out that there is statistically no difference on any of the screen-based uh, modalities. So augmented reality, virtual reality, to the screens work the same. And this is in part because the right information is being displayed. There is a a slight difference uh, when you have no screen. But even without no screen, the operators, because we have evaluated this with multiple participants, the operators perform much better than if you didn't have the robot. So the fact that you have uh, the fact that you have the handheld robot, even with just gesturing and to convey um, the intention of the robot, is sufficient for a pair of robots. And, uh, and and human to perform the task well, and much better than if you didn't have uh, that that robot. We have also uh, uh, now in the next phase of work. Uh, this is Janis Tosenwald's uh, uh, work. Uh, we have uh, also started to to look into predicting the intention of the robot. Let me. Let me now optimize this for full video. So in this work, essentially what we have is a, um, a block copying task. So the operator has to pick uh, tiles, which are simulated here on the screen from this side and place them on, the, on this other side. And there is a gaze tracker that uh, you should be able to see around here that is looking at where the, the gaze of the person is. And with that information, the robot is aiming to predict what is what you want to do next. So in this case, um, uh, there is a, a 3D gaze, and based on, on a model of intention, we are able to predict um, where the user wants to, um, wants to place that block. But it's actually very tricky to validate models uh, of intention. Uh, in robotics. So what we actually do is to kind of do the opposite. We want to frustrate the, the user to show that our model actually works. How does that work? So if our model of intention works well, we do the opposite of what, the, uh, of what we predict the user wants to do. And by doing that, the user will exhibit frustration. So the user, we, we predict the user wants to go to a specific location, we actually go in another totally different direction. And it's much easier for a robot, for, it's much easier for, for a robot to do that, and much easier for a human to complain that the robot is not helping. If the robot is just doing things and is just following our intention, um, there is, a, a, there is a, a chance that during the experimental step with humans, the humans, because of the novelty of using this type of robot, they will say, yes, this is helping me and is doing what I want. We actually want to show that that is true. And the best way to do that is to actually frustrate a person. So our model of intention indeed predicts um, and ranks the locations. And in the rebel mode of the robot, uh, it actually does the, the opposite of, of, what, uh, of, what the, um, of what the human uh, wants to do. And in this uh, final bit uh, of, this, uh, of the type of research that, that we've been doing, uh, uh, it's on remote collaboration. So essentially, we have now started to study what happens when we have a handheld robot that is mediating a remote operator that is trying to help a local user to solve a task. And um, Yanis will later in the day uh, talk more about this, so I would just very briefly uh, go over over this uh, over this um, part of the work, uh, where we have um, the remote operator providing uh, help and guidance through this robot that has now uh, cameras to observe what the robot is doing and where the robot is. So we have a context camera and a tooltip camera 
and the operator is holding holding the robot and um, we have again different modes of of operation here but essentially uh, one of the things that uh, that we have found and, and again please see Yanni's talk later today I believe it's around 11 um, uh, one of the things that we have found you know, we have done a, a, a large study with multiple participants in different combinations just to show what the effects are but just a brief summary of what we have found is that um, the time of completion with the robot helping uh, the remote operator to position the, the robot in the right locations in, in 3D space uh, is much better than if we didn't have that. Uh, but the other interesting thing is that the number of words, the number of words that the remote operator needs to use in order to com communicate um, with a local user reduces when the when the robot is able to help in the positioning and the taking of some of the measurements and, and, and placements in that space. So this is early early work, um, but uh, it's a very interesting area. What happens when these type of devices are in a remote collaboration setup? So just to uh, conclude, because I think I'm getting uh, close to time, um, the future of handhelds and other augmenters is, in my opinion, extremely interesting, interesting and promising. So the fact that we can provide uh, confidence and empowering anyone to feel that they can just go and do anything irrespective of their skills is, is something that, that I think is going to change uh, the world. Uh, because no longer you will feel that you cannot do something. Um, with this type of augmenters, uh, we, we think that we can help people to feel that they can indeed go and do anything they want and that they can participate into, into uh, many complex tasks, even if they originally felt they didn't have that yet. Um, and beyond uh, the study of and the sign of, of our devices, uh, I strongly argue that we also need to try to study what the interaction between these devices and, and us uh, can be. Uh, both for, for the positive side and for uh, looking for potential negative sides of us using these types of technology. But overall, um, there is quite a lot of challenges, interesting uh, directions of, of research in this space. And I look forward to, to hear if you have any questions. Thank you very much.